so this talk is going to be uh, looking at my passage of uh, understanding how Elixir compiler works internally um, by creating a morphological parser. And you might wonder what that word means, we'll discover it later. Um, a lot of people know what I do because I used to work in this place, but I have a diversified research hobbies that I work on. And those links are clickable, so if I upload a slide, you can just click on it. Um, I contribute to open source projects very often. Um, yeah, so there's a blog, there's GitHub, take a look. So what is this? What is this uh, morphological parser? So, you know, this is a very essential thing that we use for processing natural language. Let's say you want to build a chatbot and you need to match a lot of text. So what do you do? You don't want to match like every single word, it's just like organize, organize, is organizing because English grammar have a lot of this kind of inflection and morphology. It means like the grammar makes you write the word a different way depending on word, where it's written. So we want to give every word a canonical form. So it's a normalized form of each word. So we can do less indexing, we can do less processing later on. So for example, if you have the boys' cars are different color, if you do a lemmatization or a morphological parsing on it, you will get the boy car be dif different color, which is the essential, the root part of the word. So how would you build this thing in Elixir? And I'm very fortunate that uh, Mark presented how you do pattern matching because <laughs> essentially we do pattern matching. And how we do it is we have a root. See, root equals to organize. Now we pattern match on the root. Root becomes organize. You have a suffix that is a concatenation from organize to the suffix. So based on the suffix, if you see an E, you return an E. If you see an ES, it means organizes, but you still want to return organize, the, the lemma of the word. So as such. So you take the, take the word, look at the suffix, and then process the suffix so that the word returned is essential form. But we have a, but that's how, like, if you look at how Elixir does it, is it done, does it through parsing. So this is how, this slide shows how Elixir um, pro, like compiles the code. So first you have your Elixir source code. When you parse it, it becomes Elixir AST, the, the abstract syntax tree. And then it undergoes macro expansion and so on. We'll go through that later. So how does the AST looks like? So you have the source code on the left, AST is on the right. So you have this, uh, a lot of uh, boilerplate that made it seem that's what is called Elixir semantic. That describes the language itself. But your core data, like you, you see a E, you turn it into E, you see a E as you turn to E, that's are the actual data. The actual data is only the bottom part of it. Now we have a problem. We don't have just one word in English language, we have 50,000 words, so are we going to write all those lemma functions? That's crazy, right? So actually you don't. You write a macro to generate all those lemma one functions. So macro is part of the brilliancy of uh, Elixir. It's allowed you to uh, programmatically generate a lot of functions on the compile time. So on the right, we see that uh, we take a lot of roots, we iterate through the root, and for each root, we generate this kind of lemma. And we can think about the root as just uh, ordinary regular verbs where you can just uh, do this kind of uh, um, uh, grammar changes as you go. So this is a part where Elixir undergoes macro expansion. So when Elixir sees this kind of uh, code to do, when it does compiling, it's going to expand the macro and it becomes expanded Elixir AST. But then we also have a problem now. Remember this kind of code that we have here, this is the AST for just one word. If we expand it for, let's say 100,000 words, we have this 100,000 times, which becomes a huge problem because let's look at how long it takes to compile uh, the, the, the macro expanded uh, program. Let's say you only have 10 words, it's less than a second. 100 words, also less than a second. If you have 1,000 words, it actually takes 42 uh, seconds. So that's a lot of time spent and it doesn't scale very well. The reason why I didn't include 10,000 is because it doesn't even finish uh, on my computer. 
but you can see that when we actually run the program, because how well the Elixir beam, uh, like the Erlang beam VM is, the lemmatization, the actual running time of the program stays almost the same. So what do we do? We can't use that uh, data structure. We must, we can't use pattern matching even. So that's where, as um, like you pointed out, like where would pattern matching fail is when you have a lot of patterns to match and it's beyond the, what Elixir is designed for. Elixir is never designed for matching uh, 50,000 of words using this kind of scenario. So we can use a finite state transducer, which is what is like our, we are NLP nerd people, we use in textbook method to do this kind of lemmatization. Basically, it's just like a finite state machine that Mark presented earlier, but at each state, you would take a letter, you return a letter at the same time. So if you follow the path on the top, you have which, and when you hit ES, we just return nothing, which we just remove the suffix, and same goes with us. And you can see that by having them go through a single route up to here, we save a lot of space. So how does one build FST in Elixir? Uh, that's a difficult question, and that's why I did the hard work of not having you guys go through it. So the easy solution is just you use uh, GenFST's rule two method. Uh, this is a DSL that I created, which helps you create FST easily. So if you look at the last line here, if you want to create a rule that lemmatize organize into, organizes into organize, you just say, uh, first, give it an array. The first, if you just put a strings, it will just return the string. But if you would put a tuple of two element, it will just take, consume the first tuple, uh, the first element of the tuple, and then return the second element of tuple. So if you put organizes, it will return organize. So basically, if you want to build a lemmatization tray that for the word organize, you can just repeatedly create the rules, and then on the right, this is how the graph looks like for the finite state transducer. So far, so good. So what is the difference between GenFST and powder matching? Uh, GenFST, as you saw earlier, like we only store the data related to the lemmatization problem. We actually don't store all the Elixir semantic as opposed to powder matching. So we don't store all those uh, def, do, and all those other parentheses and etc. When we actually try to proceed to match the, the string, GenFST works in a traversal, like a try-like data structure. So it's often used in, like, maybe you're familiar with Elasticsearch, which search a string using a try-like data structure. But on the other hand, pattern matching, it's super fast, it's actually faster than FST because it is highly optimized by the BMVM. And the main difference between these two data structures is if you use GenVST, you have linear scaling your building time. And if you use pattern matching, and, and we, as we showed earlier in the graph, it doesn't scale really well. But in both cases, when you actually want to lemmatize them, the speed is constant. So another thing we want to do is, uh, what is the difference if we want to build the FST at runtime versus at compile time? So on the left, we have building the FST on the runtime, where we have a new method, where we generate the rules, return the FST at the end, or we have on the right side hand, we use a module attribute. We build the FST at the compile time, so actually when you run mix uh, compile, it actually already builds the FST for you, so when you actually run the program, the FST is already there. So what could be the difference between the two methods? And you can take a guess now because the answer will come right after. So we actually see that the compiled parser is almost four times faster than the dynamic parser. And this may seem like counterintuitive. Like you are, you are computing the same thing. You are computing the same graph. You are, one, you are doing it on runtime. One, you are doing it on compile time. What makes this huge difference? It doesn't make sense, right? So the actually answer, that's what we're trying to find is the magic happening at the last step of the compilation, is the beam assembly uh, compilation. So the magic happens, so if you know the structure of a data at compile time, 
be the, the, the compil compiler actually marked this section as don't need to be garbage collected, no need to be copied among the processes. So actually, when you run the program, it doesn't copy, it doesn't garbage collect. That's why it runs much faster. Uh, after we've done all that, we wonder, like, Elixir is super parallel computing, um, concurrency, et cetera. Can we parallelize the dynamic version of the lemmatization? And yeah, we can see, like, naively, we can just use these task async await, just take a paragraph word, uh, map all of them as async tasks, and then wait for all of them to complete. So what would go wrong here, <laughs> right? <laughs> this seems logical to do it this way, but if you use a dynamically compiled, no, dynamically constructed FST, it doesn't work because that's 500 megabytes. And for every time we create a task, it has to copy the FST to a different process, which for 80 words, we do it 80 times, which you don't really have the memory on your computer to run that much. And that's why a compiled parser actually doesn't have this problem. As we showed earlier, if you compile it, the bin uh, VM actually says, oh, this one is compiled. This one doesn't need to be garbage collected. It doesn't need to be copied across processes. So actually, with the compiled FST, you can actually uh, parallelize very easily. <coughs> so to recap, how Elixir compiled a file is you have Elixir source code undergoes parsing becomes the Elixir AST, and then undergoes macro expansion becomes the expanded AST where all the macros are being expanded. Then there are two uh, steps that goes after. One is you have Elixir uh, AST. Now everyone knows Elixir is built on, on Erlang, so you got to convert that Elixir to Erlang, which is like how TypeScript converts to JavaScript. It becomes the Erlang AST, and then undergoes further compilation to the beam assembly. So that's how it works. And through this process, we kind of discovered uh, different stages of Elixir compilation and certain assumptions we make uh, about how Elixir do things might not really be true unless you test them um, with a real program. And you might discover different ways to optimize your program uh, beyond the limitation of Elixir and its uh, underlying VM. And so that's it. If you want to learn more about uh, Elixir, that's where you go.